do I play knight d5 or bishop takes g4? Knight d5 or bishop takes g4. He's threatening c5. Jeez, I don't know what to do. This is so frustrating. So knight d5, if he takes, I get a double pawn, but then I'm getting a better knight. No, because then he would take, I'm trying to think here, knight d5 or bishop takes g4. If I go bishop takes g4, it ruins his pawn structure, but then he gets an open f file. But then knight d5, he trades his bishop for my knight. And then I get a double pawn, but then I get pressure on C. Oh, man, I don't know what to do. Do I go knight d5 or bishop takes g4? Has this gone on in your head during a game? I bet it happens all the time. Welcome to Decision Fatigue. We're going to talk about that and a whole lot more, so stick around. Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club-level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Before we dive into a recent game of mine, let's see what you had to say. You've got mail. This email is from Benjamin. Good afternoon, Neil. I want to first say that I really appreciate your podcast. I found it about a year ago and have listened to every episode. I play online and over the board with some family and friends who also enjoy the game. I am wanting to start playing in rated events, OTB, but struggle to find anything available in my area. I'm from Oregon. I am interested in starting a chess club, but don't know where to start. I am also worried there won't be enough interest in my area for a rated club. I was curious of your thought about starting a casual club building a chess community, and then transitioning the club into a rated organization. Thank you for your time, both with your effort on the podcast and for any insight you might have. Thanks for your email, Benjamin. Really appreciate the kind words. And I've received a number of comments similar to yours about starting a chess club. And I definitely have some thoughts about that. I could easily do an entire episode on this. Maybe that's something I'll do, but I'll give you some basic ideas for now. And I'm also going to link up a resource you might want to check out. So just some general thoughts. First of all, yeah, it's a great time to start a chess club because the chess boom is alive and well. Anyone who says that the chess boom is sort of waning, I completely disagree. I'm recording this in August of 2023 And the chess boom, again, is alive and well. So you'll get numbers. Now, you said maybe something about starting a casual club and then transitioning into a rated club. You could do that. But I think if you jump right into a rated club, you'll get the numbers. You know, if you build it, they will come type of thing. What was that? Field of Dreams, right? Great movie. But I digress. The thing is, Benjamin, you need to be patient. Like, don't expect to start a club And overnight, you're going to get like 50 people show up. I mean, you don't know. Stranger things have happened. You'd be surprised. You might be expecting to get a small crowd and 25 people might show up. That might happen. And and especially now, because as I said, we're in the middle of the chess boom. So you're in a better place to start than I was back in 2007. Because we started out small. I think our very first tournament, we had 12 people which was actually more than I was expecting. But we also had some lulls, and there was actually a period where I had to shut down for a few months because we weren't getting the numbers. And then we reopened, and I was patient. We built it up. I had to kind of shell out some of my own money to keep it going. But now, you know, after many years, we're doing great. I mean, we're getting anywhere from 
30 to 40 players on a regular basis. Sometimes we're getting close to 50. We're the only chess club on Long Island now. There was one, but they moved to Queens. I think there was an issue with their venue. But the point I'm trying to make is that you are going to have these ups and downs as you get started. It's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. So a few things to think about. You're going to obviously need a venue, okay, a site to hold your tournaments at. You want ample parking. A lot of people are going to be turned off if parking's an issue. You're going to need rectangular tables. You know, these are logistical things you need to think about because round tables are not going to work for two people playing chess. You need ample lighting, restrooms, ample space. There might be a venue that has a room to rent, but it's too small. Now, some ideas to check out. These are common places for chess clubs. Check out libraries, churches, community centers, schools, anything like that. Most places are going to charge a fee. You're going to have to pay rent. Some don't, but the ones that charge rent, you could probably negotiate that. Now, a word about libraries. I'm only speaking about where I am on Long Island. Our public libraries are excellent. They're probably the perfect venue to hold a chess tournament. The facilities are kept up to date. The lighting is excellent. It's climate controlled. So you have central air in the summer and heat in the winter. There's usually plenty of bathrooms around on multiple floors. There's usually ample parking. The tables and chairs are really nice. I mean, libraries are a great venue because they generally do have rooms for activities, for meetings, for organizations. The problem we have on Long Island, though, is that because they're taxpayer funded, they don't charge you. But the problem is they expect at least 50% of your members to be from that area. And that causes a problem. And it's such a shame. And they're really strict about it. Like if you ask a library on Long Island that you want to run a chess club, the first thing I'm going to ask you are, you know, where are most of your members from? So it's unfortunate because, as I said, it's probably the perfect venue for chess tournaments, but the libraries are so draconian in their rules that you really can't use it. We had started out at a library, but there were so many issues, I ended up having to leave. Now, that's just on Long Island. I can't speak for libraries in other parts of the U.S. or other parts of the world, but it's something you may want to check out. And I will say this. Often the places that don't charge you, where it's like, wow, we can meet for free, that's where you're going to have the most problems, believe it or not. It's kind of a contradiction. It's ironic. If they don't charge you, there's usually some fine print that you have to check out, and you don't want to go through the process of booking a place like that, and then it's nothing but problems. So usually the places where you have to pay rent, you have a little more flexibility, okay? And as I said, you may have to lay out your own money in the beginning until you get the numbers that you want. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but I just kind of wanted to give you some things to think about. You'll also need to get certified as a tournament director. You're going to need to get pairing software. You're going to need to get a portable printer, all these things. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you. Ultimately, it's like any project in the beginning. The initial work is a lot. But once the ball is rolling, it's not too bad. I wish you the best of luck. These are just some basic ideas to think about. As I said, now that I'm saying this, this might be a good idea to do an entire episode on this where I can really do a deep dive and get into the weeds of it. But for now, I'm going to link up a guide from the USCF, the US Chess Federation, on starting a chess club. It's like a 12-page PDF. It's online, it's available, it's free. It's called Guide to a Successful Chess Club, and it's pretty good. I I looked through it, I didn't read every word, but I kind of skimmed it, and it's pretty nice. It goes from, you know, what is a chess club, and should you start a chess club, who is your target, what you're going to offer, how to become a U.S. chess affiliate, getting off to a good start, keeping the club going, building a base. It has basically all the essentials that you need. Like I said, It's probably a little overwhelming in the beginning, but once you get the ball rolling, you'll get into a groove. And the benefit that you have, again, nowadays starting a club is that, you know, chess is on fire right now. We're still in the chess boom. 
So I suspect if you spread the word, you'll get the numbers that you want. But I wish you the best of luck, Benjamin, and thanks again for your email. All right, so let's get to the meat of this week's episode. This is a game I played against a Long Island Chess Club regular. His name is Xilin Chen. Really, really nice guy. I mean, just what a sweetheart of a guy. Really good person. He's just good people. But he is like the Terminator at the chessboard. Very, very strong player. Very consistent. Very tenacious. I have a lot of respect for him as a person and a player. He's a worthy opponent. And he very rarely has a bad night. Now, to put this in context, this was a game I played that I lost because, as I said, I'm not just going to do my wins because often the losses are much more instructive. So this was a game that I lost. Now, Xylan is a 2100 player, okay? So strong player, and that's probably part of the reason why he's so consistent and that he very rarely has a bad night, right? He's 2100 for a reason, you know, we always talk about it here. Oh, everyone is capable of having a bad night. You know, everyone makes mistakes. But there are certain players like Xylan, Tim Mirabile is another one. It's just so rare that they play poorly. I mean, they're just always on. So there are some players that, you know, they just, it's so rare where they play a bad game. Like they they have a bad night like once every solar eclipse, right? Tim Mirabile is one. I'm talking about local guys from the club. Zylan's another one. Rob Guevara, who was on this podcast, he's another one. And I like these kinds of players because they challenge you. You're not going to be able to get away with stuff. If you slip up, they are going to find the right solution. And they really sort of test where you're at. Because if you can hold your own against players like these, then you know you're in good shape. Now, I have to say, even though I lost the game, I dropped the ball towards the end. I was actually very happy with how I played against Xylan. At one point, I'll talk about this, one of the 1,800 players at the club even thought I was better, Like because after the game, he's like, I thought you kind of maybe had him. I was very happy with how I played, but I couldn't quite finish it. And Xylan, he's just strong. You know, he's That's the kind of player he is. But this was a very, very instructive game. There's a lot of themes that we're going to look at that are very practical for the club player. See, what I like to do with these game analysis episodes, I mean, this is true for most episodes, but especially these episodes where I look at a game, I like to go over themes and discuss things that are likely to appear in your own game. So I would want you to hear this and then go to the club that night or the next day, and at least one piece of this you can sort of apply or relate to in your own game. So let's talk about the game. And what I did was I put the PDF in the show notes so you can copy and paste the game into an engine. I'm very humbled by the fact that people are doing that. I kind of put the PGN just sort of as an afterthought. I'm like, I don't know if anyone's going to look at it, but then people are sending me messages that for the game analysis episodes, they like to play along with it on a board or they'll put it in an engine. And I'm, I'm really humbled by that. Now, what I do with these episodes, if this is your first time, this isn't like blindfold chess. I don't go through every single move. What I do is I kind of discuss it thematically and I discuss ideas and certain positions. So if you have the game in front of you on a board, fine, but you don't need to. If you're in the car, if you're jogging, if you're doing laundry, whatever you do while you're listening to a podcast, maybe you're at work, working, whatever it is, you don't need a board or anything like that. You can still listen to it because it's really more about the ideas. And then if you want to on your own, you can look at the game. All right. So as I discuss this, I'm going to have this opened up in chess.com using their engine. I really like their library feature and the fact that you can store and analyze your games. I spoke in a previous episode about the chess base suite where they have Fritz online. I've now been using chess.com more. I've kind of grown away from that. And don't get me wrong, chess base is still fantastic. It's a great tool, but I'm really liking the chess.com library feature. 
It uses Stockfish, I believe, and it analyzes your game. Let's look at the game from the beginning. Let's talk about these very practical and very typical ideas. So I was white and Xylan was black, of course. And as you know, I opened with D4, surprise, surprise. And he played D6, all right, which is kind of a typical idea. It's a simple queen's pawn opening. And with D6, he's probably going to follow it up with E5 at some point because he wants to hit in the center. He might have prepared this against me because everyone knows I played the London. Of course, white tries to prevent E5 ideas from black and black wants to get in E5. And if he does get it in as white, you kind of want to have him get that in on your own terms or prevent. It. So anyway, it was D4, E6. Then I played Bishop F4. And then he played G6. So he's looking to fiend Kedowa's bishop on G7, kind of a King's Indian hypermodern idea hitting at the center, right? He's hitting the E5 square. Okay, that's his goal right now. He wants to get an E5. So his D6 move is hitting E5, and then he's going to follow up with bishop G7. So his plan is clear. Now here I did something interesting. I went into my London almost reflexively, I played E3. But because his first two moves were D6 and G6, I could have gotten an E4 right away. I, I could have gotten the classic pawn center. And looking back on it, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure why I did that. Usually I would jump on it. It was probably a bit of nerves against a higher rated opponent and I wanted to keep things solid. We'll talk more about that, about the psychology of playing higher rated opponents. But that was probably my thinking. E3 is perfectly playable. It's not a mistake. Now, the chess.com computer is calling it dubious. And a few comments about the engine. You can't be too, unless it's, you know, like a blunder or like a double question mark move, something like that, unless it's like an extreme thing. You can't take some of these annotations and some of this analysis by the computer too literally. So a move that it marks as quote unquote dubious between two humans is probably fine or equal. So yeah, I could have grabbed the center with E4, but I played E3. All right, just to get my, you know, typical London idea. So he did play bishop G7. I played knight F3. This is all normal. He did knight to D7. Again, he's looking to get an E5. And then I did C3, so that typical London triangle. Pretty normal, pretty even game, nothing too crazy. And then he did get in E5, which is fine. As white, this is where a lot of people run into trouble. It's tempting to now take, right? So he played E5, and you could play it. If I go D takes E5, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly playable. But the thing is, if you go D takes E5, and then he goes D takes E5, you're basically trading your strong D4 pawn for his somewhat weak D6 pawn. Usually, white doesn't want to take there. You want, I mean, obviously, I need to move the bishop because it's being attacked. But if he takes on D4, then I can take back, like with the E pawn or even the C pawn. And if he pushes to E4, that's a little risky for black because then after my knight moves... E4 could be a little bit of a target, and his center opens up. So I moved back bishop g3, which is correct. And then he did something strange, which is knight to h6. Now, it may seem odd, the knight's on the edge of the board, right? A knight on the rim is dim, but it's actually a decent move. What he's looking to do is jump to the f5 square. He's probably looking to go knight f5, hitting my bishop. Or in some cases, he might follow with f5 and move the knight back. But most likely, he's eyeing either the g4 or the f5 square, which is normal. And he's probably going to castle. So then I played bishop e2. He then castled. This is all normal. Okay, it's still pretty much an even position, usual stuff. And then I played h3, just a little defensive move to take away his knight hopping to g4. And then he made a little bit of an inaccuracy here. And a couple things about that. So he played e4. He pushed that e4 pawn. 
And that might be asking too much of the position. So I went knight F to D2, only move that makes sense because it's being attacked. And now that attacks his E4 pawn. But by pushing E4, it also opens up the diagonal for my dark squared bishop. So a couple of things. You may say, well, this guy's strong. He's 2,100. Even players of that strength will make inaccurate moves. This is a big problem when you play higher rated players. You assume every move they make is this major threat, right? Oh, he's 2,100. Like every move, you think every move is the start of like a mate and four sequence. And it's not. They make inaccuracies too. That's why going over your games with an engine is the most important, the number one thing, the most important thing you can do as a club player is to review your games with an engine. Now, the people who say, you know, don't use an engine, try to analyze on your own, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, you can do that as long as you use an engine afterwards, but you have to look at it with an engine. And what it does, it, it sort of ego checks the higher rated players because you're going to see that they make mistakes and inaccuracies all the time. If you play a much higher rated player and you assume that every move is amazing and every move is brilliant, you're going to get crushed. Okay, so remember my attitude against high rated players, much higher rated players, is that statistically I expect that I'm probably going to lose, but I want to make the game as difficult for them as possible. I want them to say, wow, I respect you as a player. You played really well. You didn't make it easy for me. And when I adopted that attitude, I spoke about this already, that led actually to a lot of draws against high rated players. But that was my thing here. I expected him to beat me, but I wanted to play a good game and give him a run for his money. And if, if I win a draw, that's gravy. Because if you say, well, my goal is to win the game, because you might be thinking, why are you saying that? Why don't you just think, well, I want to win? The reason is that puts too much pressure on you and it might make you force things and it'll actually make things worse. So don't think, th you know, think about the process. Don't think I want to win. Think I want to play solidly and I want to make this guy think. I want to make him sweat it out. So that was my goal. And it's hard to do against Zylan because he's such a nice guy. But anyway, that's where we're at. So then he did push F5. Now you may say, well, doesn't that open up the light squared diagonal against this king, the A2 G8 diagonal? Yeah, but there's no really, you know, there's no tactics or anything. You know, if I check, which I do, he just moves his king and there's no real follow-up. This brings us to a major theme, which is the idea of pushing h4 against the castled king in the London system, especially when it's a g6 type setup. My king is in the center right now. I did not castle because, remember, when the center is closed, it's okay and sometimes even preferable to keep your king in the center, right? So the center is completely blocked. So this is a typical London idea where you push h4 while your rook is still on h1. And it works especially well against the King's Indian type setups because when black has moved his g pawn to g6, it can be a little bit weak and, and you can easily nibble at it, right? It, it's an easy position to attack. The Fian Kettled Bishop on the King side for black becomes a target of attack. So that h4 push by white is especially effective when he already has the pawn on g6, because you can treat it as a weakness. And I am trying to be a little bit more aggressive with my London, the sort of h4 idea, and then pushing to h5 while keeping the king in the middle. That's sort of new to me. I usually don't play that way. I'm much more slow and positional with the London. But in this case, I saw that the opportunity was there, and I did it. Now, of course, again, the engine says it's dubious, right? Question mark, exclamation point. But I don't see it that way. And against two humans, you know, I think it's a good move because it forces Black to think. And he did take a little bit of a think here, which is good. Now, when you play a move against a high-rated opponent and he or she takes a while to think, that's usually a good thing. That usually means it's a good move and they have to think. Or, you know, it could also mean that it's a tactical blunder and, and they're just kind of double-checking that, that it works and you're going to lose material. No, but... In this case, it's a sound move. So he had to think here for a little bit. So he didn't do anything, and then he moved b6. He's going to fiend Keto his other bishop. And then I did queen b3 check. He moves his king. A couple things about checks. 
you don't want to check your opponent's king just to check the king unless your piece ends up on a good square after the check. So you don't want to check your opponent's king, he moves it, and then your piece is in a bad position and you check them just because it felt good to check them. You don't want to do like those feel good checks. The reason I did it is because the B3 square is actually a good square for the queen. All right, and it develops the queen with a check and it's not like I have to move the queen now. It's a good square anyway. All right, and in some cases, because now that he moved B6, there might be an idea with A4, A5. You know, these are just things you have to think about. His light squares over there are now maybe a little bit weak and my light squared bishop can maybe go to B5 in some cases. You know, these are just ideas you have to think about. And then I played C4. We played some moves here. Then he did another inaccuracy. He played queen E8, all right, which the computer doesn't like. Probably doesn't matter. Like the computer gave it a question mark. But just looking at it, it's not a blunder or anything. But again, it just goes to show you that even higher rated players are not going to play like perfect moves all the time. You, you have to realize that. A lot of times what makes the difference between a higher rated and a lower rated is just the number of mistakes. They just don't blunder as much. They don't choke as much. In time pressure, they play more accurately. It's not so much that they they know more. They just they just make better moves and they, they, they blunder less. That's really what it is. You know, you could say the difference between a 1600 and a 1400, the 1600 simply makes fewer mistakes than the 1400. An 1800 player simply makes fewer mistakes than a 1600, right? This is how that thinking works as far as rating. It's not so much chess knowledge, but just the accuracy or, or the lack of your mistakes. A lower rated player is just going to make more mistakes. All right. It's not necessarily that the higher rated player knows more theory. They just handle themselves and their composure and tournament conditions better. So then we get to a major theme of this week's episode, which is decision fatigue. Now, what is decision fatigue? I'm guessing many of you have heard it. It's also called option paralysis. Sometimes they call it choice overload. Basically, your decision making starts to deteriorate because you're making so many decisions and it drains you mentally. And a chess game is sort of the ideal situation for that to happen because every single time you move, it's all about making decisions and weighing options. But when you keep making decisions over and over, it's sort of like this lock on your brain. It drains you mentally. And it's a big problem for club players. I'm sure GMs and stronger players deal with it as well. But I think it's especially a big problem for those of us at the amateur level. And that's what happened here. So we get to this position. We have 16 moves played so far. So I'm on move 17. It's, it's White's 17th move. And I'm looking at it. And I was agonizing between a couple of different moves. I was looking at bishop ch takes uh, g4, excuse me, and I was looking at knight d5. That was the, I said that in the opening to this episode, that was a little teaser. And I'm like agonizing over it. And the more I'm thinking about it, the more mental fatigue I'm experiencing. And the truth is, it gets to a point where you just, you need to make a decision because you're just wasting mental energy. Now it turns out, I ended up playing knight d5, which is an excellent move. Either one would have been good. The reason I was hesitant, because I said if I play knight d5, it doubles my pawns, but I have an open c file. I thought that doubled pawn on d5 was going to be a weakness. Looking back on it now, I mean, this is always the case, right? Looking at it now, knight d5 is pretty obvious. However, bishop takes g4 also would have been good. I was worried that it was going to open up the f file, but White is fine after that. And, you know, I thought about it and I ended up doing knight d5, but it was after a long thing because knight d5 hits his rook. And my thinking was if he takes with the bishop, he's giving up a potentially good bishop. His light squares on that side are going to be weak and his c7 pawn is weak. I mean, like I said, I'm just, you know, looking at it now, I should have played this almost instantly, but that's what happens during the game nerves or whatever you know, decision fatigue. So if he takes with the bishop, like I said, I have those advantages. If he doesn't, then I have an excellent knight on d5. So I did play after this decision fatigue, 
I did play knight d5, and after a long think, he did take it. So I now have an open c file against his backward pawn on c7. Okay, it's a weak pawn, and so it's a semi open file. So the c file is now a line of attack. And I guess the reason why I was so hesitant was again this decision fatigue. And we'll we'll talk about why that happens and how to prevent it. I mean, basically, it, it just comes from playing. You're making all these decisions against a strong player over and over and over again. It gets to a point where your brain is fried. And in a little bit, I'll speak about some ways to fight it. But with decision fatigue, and I'm sure you experience it, it it's something you need to be aware of. Like a, a lot of players, I think they just, they kind of go through it. That you You need to know when you're experiencing that. And you need to take steps to fight that, which I'll talk about at the end of the game. I just want to get to the moves now. We continue a few more moves, and I end up pushing to h5, and I really like this move. Now, again, we spoke about this earlier. My king is uncastled. It's still in the middle because I have pawns on f2, e3, and d4. He has a pawn on e4 and f5. Now, right now, I'm not too worried about an F4 push. So my king is fine in the middle because the center is completely locked up. There's no tactics. So I pushed H5, okay, which I like. And again, this is a slightly more aggressive way for me to play, but I really like the position here. And then the engine says it's pretty much even, but I like the move a lot. So I'm chipping away at his castled king side. He then moved G5. So I go H5 attacking his G6 pawn. He pushed it, okay, which is probably the best move. I push the pawn again. So my H pawn is now on H6. He goes Bishop F8. And I want to talk about another major theme here, which is huge, which is that at the time, I thought, and a friend from the club who saw the game thought after, that I was much better almost winning here. And at a glance, it might seem that way because my king is perfectly safe in the middle. My pieces are pretty well placed. He really has nothing going on. I mean, he's attacking d5. I need to watch out for that. But because of my advanced h pawn and because I'm sort of opening up a little bit of an attack towards his king, it seems like white is much better. But this is a major theme, which is you often think that one player is much better but it turns out the game's completely even. Like this happens all the time. Like, oh, I played this game. You know, I had the black pieces. I was so much better. You put it in the engine and it's like perfectly even. So just because it looks or appears that one side might be better because it seems they have an advanced piece doesn't mean they're winning. The position right now is perfectly even. But I thought during the game that I was much better. And that that can get you into trouble, that false sense of security, like, oh, I'm definitely winning, and you're not. Black is totally fine here. But regardless of that, regardless of that, it's even, I'm still very happy with how I'm playing. And then I started to make a few inaccuracies here. We kind of went back and forth. And then what happened is the brain fog kicked in. And brain fog, which I'm sure you experienced as well, is sort of a branch of decision fatigue. So I know for me, I get this brain fog late in the game. Brain fog basically meaning a lack of focus, like a fuzzy thinking. You're confused. It's sort of like a dazing, a spacing out. You know, I I call it getting the fuzzies. You know, I'm like, oh, geez, I got the fuzzies there where like your brain, like you just can't think anymore. And Before people say this, because this is going to drive me crazy, they're going to say, oh, well, it's an age thing. You're getting older. It's not an age thing. It's a chess thing. Because even when I was younger, even when I played like in my early 30s or my late 20s, I would still get it. So for the people like, oh, well, you know, you're getting the brain fog because you're 51, you're old. You know, that's why you're getting the brain fog. You've aged out of improvement. No, that's not it. It's a chess thing. Because like I said, even like decades ago when I played, I would still get this, okay? I've heard high school kids tell me that they experienced this. So again, it's a chess thing. It's not an age thing. I truly believe that. I mean, unless there's something actually, you know, a physiological situation you're dealing with or something like that, it's a chess thing. It just happens because you're constantly thinking and the mental energy required 
is such that you're going to get this brain fog. Now, yes, yeah, some people will get it less than others. Higher rated people probably get it less than lower rated, lower rated people, excuse me, but it's real, okay? This brain fog is part of the game. It's something you have to deal with. And as far as fighting decision fatigue and brain fog, once I wrap up the game, I want to speak to that a little bit because it is something very important. So at this point, to sort of make a long story short, the brain fog kicked in fully and I ended up dropping two pawns. My 35th move, queen c6, was a double question mark blunder, which led to a tactic. Now it's funny. This is another thing. This is sort of part of brain fog and decision fatigue. I saw this tactic early on. I defended against it. But then you're looking at other things, then you forget about it. So when I moved my queen, I forgot he had this tactic. And then once he played this, once he played bishop takes d4 on move 35, pretty much over. And then he ended up winning two pawns, and then I sort of fell apart in time pressure. Up until this point, despite the few missteps that I had, I was pretty happy with how I played, considering how strong a player Xylan is. And I definitely learned a lot from this game. So that's the game. Now let's take a minute to kind of recap, talk about a few things. And I want to address brain fog and decision fatigue specifically. So just some post-game comments to wrap this up in terms of how to handle decision fatigue and brain fog during a game. Chess is a prime arena for decision fatigue and brain fog because it's an activity that involves constant decision making and weighing options and that wears you down. Remember, decision fatigue comes from constantly making decisions one after the other. It just wears you down mentally. That fatigue leads to brain fog, especially in very, very tough games such as the one I had. Now, one cure and it's the only cure that I know of, and it works, you have to get up from the board and clear your head. That's what you need to do. Now, my problem to this day, even though I'm aware of it, I get stubborn and I don't do it. I just end up wanting to stay at the board, and you can't do that. If you're feeling indecisive, frustrated, confused, anything like that, overwhelmed, you need to get up, step away from the board. Get a drink, eat something quickly, put some water on your face. You need to do that. Now, there's some advice out there that you should never get up from the board and, you know, never get up from the board, you know, always, you know, be, that's moronic, at least at the amateur level. That makes no sense to me. If you're having trouble, if you can't find a move, if you can't find an idea, if you just sort of feel mentally shot, you can't understand what your opponent's plans are, why would you stay at the board, right? Why would you stay there if nothing's happening? If you're feeling any type of brain fog or decision fatigue, you need to do a reset. And the only way to do that is to step away for a moment. Now, yes, I know the clock is at play and you don't want to get into time pressure. I get it. So yes, you have to do this within reason. I'm not saying you need to get up for 20 minutes, but even if it's just for a minute or two, that will make a big difference. And when you step away, don't think about the position. Just clear your head. You know, look out the window or whatever. You know, e even if, well, I don't know if you should do this, but, you know, even if you just check your phone just to distract you for a second, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because that's how you do the reset. You need to step away from it and come back. And you'll be amazed at how much that helps. And the thing is, you may need to do this several times during the game. You can't just get up once, okay? Getting up just once from the game is not going to fight decision fatigue. This is a major problem. It's something that I think a lot of us don't handle effectively. And this is something that you have to play through. I'm not sure that doing puzzles or buying courses or going on Amazon and buying chess books, you know, 10 at a clip is going to fix this. This comes from playing and from awareness and from practicing how to fight decision fatigue. And again, the best way to do it, the only way that I know of, is just to get up from the board for a moment and come back. And a lot of people don't do that. You need to do those quick resets during the game. 
And I have to remind myself constantly of that. So as far as the chess portion of this episode, I'm going to leave it there. Now, I do have some remarks regarding the show itself, some programming notes. If that does not interest you, if you just wanted to hear about the chess and you couldn't care less what I, what I have to say about the show itself, you can safely log off and I'll see you next week. I hope you win your next game. For those of you who are interested in a few very brief comments, it's a quick thing. This isn't going to be like a 10 minute thing, a couple of minutes. If you're interested in those comments about the show, stick around. So a couple of things about the show. I guess if you're listening to this, you are a true fan of The Chess Angle, and I really, really appreciate it. Really love everybody for listening and all the support. So very quickly, as you know, there is a YouTube channel for the podcast. You can just look for The Chess Angle Podcast on YouTube, and it'll show up. And of course, there's always a link in the show notes. Now, at this time, I will not be posting video podcasts and we'll keep it as I have been as a still image with the audio. It's really a workflow thing because the way I have it now to make a long story short, when I upload the podcast to my RSS feed, it's basically with one button. I can upload it or schedule it with one button. It actually posts to YouTube as well, which is extremely convenient. And if I were to now do a video instead, like the actual video of myself and my guest or just myself, whatever it is, that's a whole nother workflow thing. It's additional editing. It's a whole thing. Whereas if I just keep it the way I have it, it automatically uploads to YouTube with the show notes and everything. That's awfully convenient for me. And with my schedule now, I'm going to keep that in place. Basically, for me to add the video component at this time is going to be too much. And it really makes no sense when, again, it's automatically being uploaded to YouTube at the same time that it goes to Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all of those. So I'm going to keep it the way it was. I know a few episodes back, I said I was experimenting with using video podcasts. Well, that's why I use the word experimenting. I tried it but it just wasn't happening. And again, the YouTube channel for this podcast, it's really a billboard for the main podcast. I mean, most people, if they find it on YouTube, they're going to end up going on Spotify and listening to it there. Anyway, most people just listen as well, but that's really what it is. It's a billboard to direct people to the main audio podcast, whatever it is in Spotify, Apple podcasts, whatever app, people use. I mean, that being said, the next time you're on YouTube, if you would subscribe to the channel just for support, it would be greatly appreciated. So if you would consider doing that, that would be awesome. One other thing about YouTube, I do plan at some point because I genuinely do enjoy this stuff. It's a labor of love for me. It's not like work. Okay. Right now I'm in graduate school, which is a big time suck for me. I'm very proud of that, but It's a lot right now, so I only have so much bandwidth that I can devote to chess. But one thing I plan on doing, this is maybe like another year from now, something like that, I do want to resurrect the club channel, that is the Long Island Chess Club YouTube channel, which is a separate channel from the Chess Angle podcast. Now, the Long Island Chess Club, I'll call it the LICC, the LICC channel, it's up and running, it's there, there's just nothing on it. It was one of those things I had created it a while back and was going to put some things on there, but it never happened. Now, here's my goal with that. That channel, the LICC channel, that's going to be a legit YouTube channel. Like That's a channel I genuinely want to build and get a good following, and hopefully it'll be something that'll really help people. Now, you may say, why are you going to do that? You know, YouTube is like saturated. Why would you want to do that? I'm going to tell you why because here's my plan. I intend to have short instructional videos using games from the club. It's intended for people like you and me, people who work full time, who have a family, who have a life outside of chess, who who can't sit there and watch YouTube videos for three hours a day. They're going to be short videos, probably 10 minutes or less. 
And it's going to be all practical ideas and positions you will actually face. Like, I want you to look at these videos and be like, I'm going to use this tonight at the club. Or you're going to look at the video and say, oh, you know what? I, I just saw this in the YouTube video. In other words, I want it to be very practical for the club player. And these will be legitimate YouTube videos. It's not going to be like a still image. It's going to be your typical YouTube chess videos. Like, I'll be on camera. There'll be a board. And, you know, you'll see the moves. It, it'll be purely instructional, completely different from the podcast channel. That's the plan anyway, all right? That's what I plan on doing. That's not a promise, but that's my goal. And I will genuinely enjoy that. Like, I, you may say, well, you know, why create more work for yourself? I don't look at it as work. I do enjoy it. It's also selfishly a form of study for myself. But again, this is something maybe a year from now, approximately, give or take, that I plan on starting I think I'm really going to get a kick out of it, but we'll see. You know, who knows, right? The vagaries of life. Who knows what's going to happen? That's just the plan, right? Best laid plans, right? Man plans, God laughs, right? All that stuff, I know. Who knows what's going to happen? But that's the plan anyway. So I just wanted to go over that stuff for YouTube as far as the podcast itself and the club in terms of what's happening. So I really appreciate you listening. If you stuck around for that last segment, that really means you're a true fan of the pod. I really, really appreciate it. And I know I said it already, but I'll say it again. I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everybody.